Well, good morning, Beach Point Church. It's so good to be with you. How are you guys doing today? All right, I heard that this is the loud party group, okay? I heard this is the service that makes some noise. So how are you guys doing this morning? Good, awesome. As Bill said, my name is Ken Primo, and uh, I serve as the lead pastor of Mercy Road Northeast in uh, the northeast suburbs of Indianapolis, uh, which in case you're like, where is that? It's in the state of Indiana, which uh, in case you're like, not sure where that is, it's in the Midwest. Uh, and so uh, it's so good being here, and uh, I want to take a moment, actually, there's people joining with us online, and so can we give a warm welcome to those who are attending online? Thanks for joining with us. So it feels like coming home, and I see so many familiar faces throughout the room, and uh, it's so great to be here. As Bill had said, my wife actually grew up at Beach Point Church, and so Bill was her youth pastor, and we have so many great memories of this place. And then we got married here in this room in 2006, uh, and then I was like, I'm never going to work at, at my wife's family church. Like, she grew up there and whatnot, and then 10 and a half years of uh, being on staff here, incredible journey. Uh, journeying with many of you uh, serving in the trenches together. And so I'm just so grateful to be here. And uh, we, in 2020, we moved at the end of February. I started March 1st, 2020 at a church in Indiana. And uh, the timing was perfect. I mean, because... <laughs> Two weeks later, you might have heard of COVID-19 uh, hit, shut the world down. And so people were calling, and it was like April, May, uh, and they're like, how's Indiana? We're like, we don't know. We haven't left our house yet. They're like, how's the food? We haven't eaten anywhere yet, you know? <laughs> like, how are the people? We hit, we're online. We haven't met anyone yet, you know? Uh, so it was just a, a incredible timing of we arrived there, and then the world shut down. But God has been so good, and in September of 2020, we planted a church uh, and uh, about 30 minutes away from uh, the, the mother church that we were planting out of, and God has been so good. We, in September, went to three services, and the church has been busting at the seams, uh, running out of parking and kids' spaces. We're baptizing people. We're helping plant another church right now, and it's just incredible what God has been doing, uh, but we miss you guys and so glad to be uh, back home, getting to be here and, and share the updates. You know, I want to challenge us to listen for the voice of God as we're going to read God's word together today. And I think it's one thing to listen, but it's another to obey, right? God might ask us to do things, and then we don't actually do it. And the life of a disciple, or we call it an authentic follower of Jesus here at Beach Point, the life of a disciple is a life of listening to him and then putting it into practice and obeying. And I, I think some of the things that we're going to talk about today, we might just want to listen and not actually do it. So I want to pray that we would actually obey. So Jesus, I pray you would speak, God, that as we uh, read through your word, um, God, that you would be present in this place, God. We have seen your faithfulness in the past, and God, I pray that you would be faithful right now, God, to show up. Your Holy Spirit, God, would speak to us, God, that we would have ears to listen, and then, God, that we would actually obey and do what you're asking us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Bill told me that you guys are doing this series called Blueprint. You're going through the Beatitudes, and he asked me to speak to you about mercy. And the first thing that popped into my mind was a Karate Kid. You guys remember the Karate Kid? So in the Karate Kid, the, the instructor of Cobra Kai, he's a man named Kreese, and he tells his students, we do not train to be merciful here. Mercy is for the weak. We all love that line, right? Mercy is for the weak. Here in the streets, in the competition, a man confronts you. He is the enemy. An enemy deserves no mercy. Mercy is for the weak. That's the slogan of Cobra Kai, but it's also the slogan of many people in our culture today. That you have to fight to get yours. And I've earned what I've got. They deserve what they're getting. I, I worked for this. Mercy is for the weak. But in the kingdom of God, all of that is turned upside down. And as we read through the Beatitudes, you see the kingdom of God is a complete reversal. And in reality, mercy is not for the weak. Mercy is for the merciful. And if you give mercy, God promises that you'll be the type of person that will receive mercy. God's mercy. Matthew chapter five, verse seven, it says this, blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown what? They'll be shown mercy. Blessed or happy are the merciful, why? Because they will receive mercy from God for themselves. Now we gotta define mercy, and you've maybe heard it defined 
various different ways. I'm going to steal from uh, my seminary professor, and he said mercy, this Greek word is eleemon, that's uh, in Matthew 5, 7, and he defined it this way, generous in doing deeds of deliverance. My professor in seminary is a scholar on the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. He's like a world-leading scholar, so I'm like, he seems smart. I'm going to go with his definition. Mercy is generous in doing deeds of of deliverance. And I want us to see two different ways that this plays out, this idea of doing deeds of deliverance. Two different ways that we see and experience mercy. And the first way, another word we could use is compassion. It's doing deeds of deliverance to help people who are in need, being the hands and feet of Jesus, showing compassion to the needy and helping them to deliver them out of their need and suffering. So it's the first is compassion we're going to look at. The second aspect of mercy we're going to look at is forgiveness, which is delivering someone out of their guilt. Forgiveness, bringing freedom to yourself and another. So we're going to look at both of those aspects of mercy today. Now, if you turn on the news, if you scroll through social media, right, we get bombarded with the pain, suffering, tragedy that's, uh, that's in the world. And, and this is so unique that now we have at our fingertips, like the first thing you wake up in the morning is like tragedy and a, another school shooting and, and all of this pain and suffering. And if you're someone who has a lot of sympathy or empathy for others, not me, okay? My wife is that way. My wife is wired that way. And if you, the news and the social media and all that stuff, you begin to absorb all the pain of the world, and I don't know that God created us with that in mind of like you and I to play God and absorb the pain and suffering of the world, but it's, it's at our fingertips. And so maybe for you, it's really difficult to be able to watch the news or, or scroll through social media because y- you begin to take it all on and it's, it, it becomes depressing. It becomes too much for you. Or maybe you're like me and you don't have a high level of empathy. Okay, I'm just being honest, being, being real here this morning. And some of you are wired like that as well. And it's like you, you can watch the news and handle it. And you just become numb, right? You just stop feeling. You just stop caring. It's just another thing on the news. And then we have, beyond that, you've got your friends and your family. And you get, you know, a prayer request from a neighbor and their kid is going through a a difficult season. You've got a family member or friend who's battling cancer. You've got a, a tragedy of a friend of a friend who lost a loved one, and, and, and you've got the pain and the suffering of your extended friend group, and then you've got on top of that your own personal stuff, right? You've got your own fears, your own worry, your own pain, your own suffering, and it can become so much, and it can become to this point where we just get numb, and we just stop caring, and we just stop feeling, and we begin to see then maybe in the world all this suffering, all this pain, and we think, what can I do, right? You've ever thought that you're like, How could I actually make any kind of impact or dent when there's all of this suffering and all of this pain and our hearts get hardened and we decide I'm going to do nothing? Well, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, the Apostle Paul, he writes and he says this, let us not become weary in doing good. Let us not become disheartened and to give up and become weary and just go, hey, I'm just not going to do anything. Don't let your heart be hardened, he says. And then he says, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest, if what? If we do not give up. He's saying, don't disengage, don't give up, don't ignore the hurting and the suffering and the pain in the world. And then in verse 10, he goes on and says this, therefore, as we have opportunity, everybody say opportunity. Opportunity. As we have opportunity, and it's this interesting Greek word, kairos, and what it means is these God moments, these God appointments, these divinely appointed opportunities that God places in your life and in mine, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. He says, as you get opportunities, God's gonna place in your sphere of influence, we call it your eight to 15, that there's eight to 15 people in your life that God has placed and strategically put you there And there is going to be God opportunities if you'll keep your eyes up for you to show the compassion of God doing good deeds. Don't get weary of this. God's going to place in your sphere of influence opportunities for you to do good to all people, but especially to those who belong 
to the family of believers. And Beach Point Church, we are called, you are called to be a family and to meet the needs of those around you. And there's gonna be opportunities for you to, to love and show the compassion of Christ to the people around you. And if we can't do that as the family of God, then we won't do that for the world. And God's called us to do both. Now, mercy is about having compassion for the needy God has placed in your sphere of influence. And I think many of us, we get overwhelmed with all these needs and we decide, well, I'm just not gonna do anything for anyone. And I love, I went to a conference a number of years ago with Beach Point, our whole staff went at Mariners, and Pastor Andy Stanley, he said this one line, and it stuck with me for years, and I want to share it with you. He said this, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Isn't that good? Do for one person what you wish you could do for everyone. We get so overwhelmed by the suffering, the needs, poverty, sex trafficking, racism, orphans, widows, there's just so much. And we decide, well, I'm just not gonna do anything for anyone. It's just too overwhelming. But what if you were to do for one what you wish you could do for everyone? I know some of you are thinking, well, Pastor Ken, if I do for one, then I have to do that for everyone, right? Like you do as parents uh, with your kids. It's like, if I do this for one kid, then they're, all the kids are gonna want it, right? And, and we feel like there's just some rule, like life has to be fair. And if I do for one, I gotta do it for everyone. No, you don't. I'm the youngest of four. I was like, mom and dad, you can do for me. <laughs> and you don't have to give for, for my siblings as well, right? Like, do for me and, and to tell them no, right? Life doesn't have to be fair. And I think for many of us, we decide, I'm not gonna do for anyone because I, I wanna be fair, but God's gonna call you and he's gonna give you divine opportunities, kairos moments, these moments, opportunities for you to show compassion and to do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. I remember being the young adult pastor here, and we had this young adult guy come in, tatted out. His name was Buster, and, and uh, he, you could tell he had a past. He had, like, neck tattoos and the whole thing, and, and uh, so he started coming to our, our ministry. And uh, there was one night he called me up at, at 3 a.m., and he had got into a fist fight with his dad. And his dad ended up in the hospital, and Buster ended up on my couch at 3 a.m., now, my wife and I, we didn't know him very well at this time, and so uh, we were like, this guy is a little bit sketchy, uh, but we knew God had called us to, to let him come into our house, and, and I was like, honey, hide your jewelry, okay? <laughs> like, honey, like, like expensive stuff, get, like, let's hide things, put things in the safe, okay? Uh, and then, you know, he woke up, and, and we began praying, God, what, you know, what do we want us to do? And that turned in from one night, turned into one year, of him living on our couch. Actually, we gave him a, a bed eventually and a room. And Buster lived with us for a year. And in that year, we got to disciple him and we baptized him. And there was the death of the old Buster and the resurrection of the new uh, Manny Gallegos is his name and many of you uh, know him. And Manny, we got to see the transformation and the healing in his relationship with his dad. And we saw the transformation of his life now, we did for Manny what we wish we could have done for everyone, but we couldn't have you know, 80 or 100 young adults live at our house and sleep on our couch. But we could do that for one. And I was texting with Manny this morning, and he is up at Thousand Pines. He's become a youth pastor, and he's taken a group of students. I believe we have a picture of it. These kids, it's their first time going up to uh, Thousand Pines Christian Camp, and he told me as of last night, every single one of those kids have given their life to Christ. Isn't that amazing? He's doing for them what he wishes he could do for everyone. And so instead of just having a general concern for students, what if you were to do for one student what you wish he could do for everyone? Instead of just having a general concern for poverty, what if you were to go, hey, I, I wanna invest in, in, in Oakview, as Beach Point is, in, in an impoverished neighborhood, and, and not only do I wanna give money, but here's what I want to challenge you on. As you show the compassion of Christ, to pay the cost of mercy is to go beyond just giving money, which you should do, but also give your time, give your heart, give relationship, serve other people. And so what if instead of just going, hey, I have a general concern for poverty, to go, hey, I'm going to do for one family what I wish I could do for everyone. Instead of just having a general concern for orphans, hey, we're going to do for one what we wish we could do for everyone, and we're going to adopt I don't know what God's gonna call you to, but in your 
sphere of influence, God is going to give you, God ordained divinely, opportunities for you to show the compassion and the mercy of God for others. And I want to encourage you to just, instead of going, hey, general, hey, hopefully at some point, no, to do for one, that God's going to bring you opportunities, God's going to bring you people, and to do for them what you wish you could do for everyone. And so I want you to ask this prayer, Lord, who are you placing in my sphere of influence? that you want me to show mercy and compassion to? Who is my one? And maybe the one is gonna change over time. There'll be different seasons, but maybe the one will be even for your family or you as a couple, a married couple, you as an entire family, you might have a one. My wife and I, when we, we, we lived in Huntington Beach and we had a neighbor, uh, amazing elderly woman who has no family. And so she became our family. She was the one for our family and we, uh, you know, bring meals over and we invite her to Christmas and, and, and she's become part of our extended family and we'll take her to doctor's appointments and, and, and we will, uh, I'm not very handy, but she'll ask me to like come and fix stuff and I'm like, I can change the light bulb, I can do this, you know, and, and we've done for one what we wish we could do for everyone. So maybe it'll be a family thing for you, but that's the first aspect of mercy that we need to learn is because mercy is for the merciful, you and I need to do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. The second aspect of mercy, and this gets a little harder, is the idea of forgiveness. See, the religious leaders in Jesus' day, they were merciless because they had such a high standard of the, the Old Testament Torah, the, the law, of what people needed to live up to. And anyone who fell short of that they wanted to give judgment, not mercy. And I see this in our culture as well, right? I want mercy for me, but I want justice and judgment for everyone else. We see this in culture with cancel culture, right? You made a mistake, you didn't measure up to my standards, and we're gonna cancel you. We're gonna fire you, we're gonna get rid of you. We want mercy for us. Like if I make a mistake, if you make a mistake, it's like, hey, give me some forgiveness, give me some grace, give me some mercy, right? But for everyone else, they need to get what they deserve. It got me, reminded me of this old story. There was a, a man who was bitten by a dog and they were worried that the dog had rabies. And so the doctors did tests and they discovered, yes, this man had contracted rabies. And this was a long time ago, so they didn't have any remedy or cure. So the doctor had to inform this man that you are going to die. We're going to do what we can to, to help comfort you, but you are going to pass away. And so he said, my best advice is for you to put your affairs in order as soon as possible. Well, after the shock had worn off on this man, he asked for pen and paper, and he began to write. And the doctor left, and he came back, and the man was still frantically writing, and the doctor came and he said to him, hey, I'm, I'm really glad that you're getting your affairs in order and you're writing your will. The man said, this ain't no will, doc. This is a, a list of people I'm gonna bite before I die. <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> you see, some of you, you don't have a written list, but you've got a list in your heart of people that I, I'm not gonna forgive. I'm not gonna show mercy. And I love how C.S. Lewis, he said this, forgiveness is a beautiful word until you have something to forgive. That's when it gets real, that's when it gets hard. See, we all need to learn how to show mercy to others. We all need to learn how to show forgiveness to others. And to see this, I want us to turn in a passage in Matthew chapter 18 in your Bible. So you guys ready to study God's word? I heard that you were the party group. Are you guys ready to study God's word this morning? Make some noise. All right, open up a Bible to Matthew chapter 18. If it's the Pew Bible in front of you, I think it's 799 or 699, one of those pages, but Matthew 18. You can power on your Bible. And we're gonna look at this concept of mercy as forgiveness. It's so illustrated beautifully here. As one of Jesus' disciples, a man named Peter, he has a discussion with Jesus about forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. 799, is that right? Anyone shout it out, yeah? Okay, great. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times, Peter asks. 
Jesus answered, verse 22, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Let's pause there. We're gonna come back to the passage. But in, in Jewish tradition, at the time, the rabbis taught that you had to forgive someone three times. And if someone sinned against you a fourth time, it was clear that they had not repented. And so you're off the hook. And so Peter, who's following Jesus, he's like, he's seen the compassion, he's seen the forgiveness, he's seen the grace of Jesus, and he knows, okay, Jesus is gonna go over three, right? So he's, he thinks he's being generous. He's like, I'm gonna double it and add one on seven. Jesus, do I need to forgive someone seven times? And he's thinking, oh man, I'm the A student in the class, I'm gonna get this right. And Jesus says, 77 times. Now, I don't think Jesus just made up a random number. I believe that Jesus was referencing Genesis chapter four, and I'm gonna put it here on the screen here for you. One of Cain's descendants, Lamech, he's bragging about the revenge he's gotten, the, the justice, the, the vengeance that he's gotten. In Genesis four, verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. He says, I have killed a man for what? For wounding me. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. He says, one of you know, his descendants, uh, Cain, if Cain is avenged, what, seven times, then Lamech, he's talking about himself, 77 times. What he's talking about is revenge. This man wounded me, this young man, I killed him. I got revenge. He got what was coming to him, and I got 77 times the avengeance. Now, Jesus says the kingdom of God flips that upside down. And instead of getting revenge, I want you to forgive 77 times. I want you to extend the mercy of God 77 times. Now I wanna be clear here. This doesn't mean that you let people walk all over you doesn't mean that you're in an abusive relationship and you just let them continue to harm you. You see, forgiveness does not mean trust has been replaced. We need to understand this in our relationships that just because you forgive someone, trust is earned. And trust might need to be rebuilt when it's been lost. But forgiveness is freely given. And so we're called to forgive And so Jesus tells Peter to forgive over and over again. And then Jesus does what he always does. And he tells a story. He tells a parable to illustrate this truth. And so he goes on to explain, blessed are the merciful, right? For they will be shown mercy by telling the story of a king with an indebted indebted, indebted servant. Verse 23 says this. Therefore, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like a king who wanted to settle his account with his servants, And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold or 10,000 talents is what it literally says, was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So the servant owes 10,000 talents, which you and I are like, I don't know, is that a lot? Is that a little? Like, I I don't know what that is. A talent was a, a, a unit of measure, a weight of money that was equal to about 6,000 denarii for one talent. A denarii was uh, one day's wages. So this is about one talent, one bag of gold is 20 years wages. Someone's gotta work 20 years to get that. And this man owes 10,000 of those. Okay, so it would take him like 200,000 years to be able to pay this back. Okay, this is a hyperbole. This amount of debt is insane. This guy has been borrowing money and buying islands, okay? He's been borrowing money and buying small countries. He's indebted. And this guy's way in over his head. It's not the kind of thing where it's like, well, hey, kids, we're just not gonna go to Disneyland this year. We're gonna, you know, not gonna have any vacations. We'll cut back a little bit and then we'll pay this debt off. This is a debt that he will never be able to repay. And let me just say, this is a parable for your sin and mine and our need for God's grace. It says, at this, the servant fell on his knees before the king. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay everything back. The servant's master took pity on him, had mercy on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. 
So this guy who owes 200,000 years of working wages, the king erases the debt, forgives him, and sets him free. It's the mercy and forgiveness of God. Well, then this man leaves the king's presence, and he runs into an old buddy who owes him some money. And we read in verse 28, it says this, but when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins, or literally it's denarii, 100 Denari. And a denari, I told you already, was one day's wages. And so this is like a hundred days wages, about three months worth of income. After a year, two years, three years, the servant would have been able to pay back this debt. But it says he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees, exact same posture that he had taken, and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Now, as I read that story, I begin to think to myself, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> I'm like, what is he doing? He was just forgiven this insane amount of debt and then he turns and he holds accountable someone else who's got a small minuscule amount of debt in comparison. I'm like, who does this guy think he is? And then I begin to realize that I'm that man in the story. That I sin and I fall short and God asks me to do things and I don't do them and God says don't do this and I do that and I, and I, I fall short and then in tears I come back to God and I ask for his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy and he lovingly extends that to me. And then I turn to my wife and I dish out a lack of grace. I have a lack of mercy towards her, or I go to my friends or my kids or people who have hurt me and I give them nothing but judgment, anger, justice. And I begin to realize we do this all the time, don't we? We take mercy and grace from God and then we give out unforgiveness. I want mercy for me, but I want justice for everyone else. But mercy is for the merciful. And if you want to be the type of person that experiences the mercy of God in your life, you've got to be the type of person who's willing to extend it to others. The passage continues on. When the other servants saw what had happened, they're upset, okay, like we would be. They're, they're mad. And they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master, the king, called in the servant, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. And then God says this, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you, will for, you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. See, when you choose to receive forgiveness, you and I are obligated to extend forgiveness. When we receive mercy, we're ob obligated to be merciful towards others. And I, I began learning this lesson as a college student at Pepperdine. Uh, I, I went to Pepperdine and I met my now wife, Carolyn, uh, our freshman year. And we started dating our freshman year. And then for sophomore year, she went overseas to Germany to study abroad with about 50 Pepperdine students over there. I stayed in Malibu. Uh, I had grown up in Winnipeg, Canada, and I was like, I just got to Malibu. I'm hanging out here on the beach. I'm not going overseas. My wife was born and raised in Huntington Beach, and so she wanted to travel the, the, the world. And so we were dating at the time, and then we did the long distance dating thing. You guys ever been there? Okay, we did the long distance dating uh, thing. And then we took a break from dating, and that break's name was Mark, okay? <laughs> There was a guy named Mark in Germany, and, uh, and so Mark had swooped in on our dating relationship, and I was so angry at this guy, because it was like, how dare you? I'm thousands of miles away, and Mark, you swooped in on my girlfriend, and we broke up, and, and, uh, and so I was so furious with him. Well, uh, junior year, everyone came back. We're all in Malibu at Pepperdine once again. And uh, Carolyn and I started dating again, and we, we got back together. And then I would see Mark, and, and I would do, be like, Ugh, you know what I'm talking about? Like just staring him down as he would walk by. 
Like, oh, just say one word, man, and, and I'll, you know, I'm ready to go. And so I had all this anger and animosity towards him. And then I read this passage, and the Spirit of God began to speak to me. And I realized that like, God was asking me to do something I did not want to do, which was to forgive him. And I decided to forgive him, and, and I got to a place where I genuinely was willing to release him of his debt. And, and at the same time, uniquely, he was willing to ask for forgiveness. And not everyone's going to ask for forgiveness of you. But he asked for forgiveness, and I, I extended forgiveness to him. And we actually became friends. Uh, and Mark and I became friends throughout college. And uh, it was actually due to this passage. And now he's my financial advisor. So you just never know <laughs> what God's going to do is you extend mercy to others. You see, the forgiven forgive. Mercy is for the merciful. So I want to ask you, who do you need to forgive? Who's God bringing to mind right now that you need to show them God's mercy that he has extended to you? Now, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be friends like Mark and I were. Trust has to be earned and, and maybe there won't be that friendship. Maybe the relationship won't be reconciled. But forgiveness isn't just about changing the other person. It's also about releasing your own heart. Now, maybe you're at a place where you're like, hey, Pastor Ken, like, I know who I need to forgive, and I'm just not there yet. They've hurt me, they've abused me, they've harmed me, and I'm not at a place where like, I can genuinely release that yet. And maybe for you this morning, it's a prayer of, Jesus, I want to get to a place where I can forgive. Would you begin to help me to begin that journey? But I think the starting place for us to live out this mercy towards others is to get in touch with how much grace God has given you. To recognize that you are indebted to God, that you, what you have done, you cannot pay him back. That you and I have fallen short of the glory of God and we need his mercy. And I love how the apostle Paul, he planted churches all over the place, wrote a bunch of the New Testament, but what, here's what he said about himself in 1 Timothy 115. He said, here's a trustworthy saying that it deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And here's what he said, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy. So that in me, the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. And so right now, we're gonna celebrate communion and hopefully you got it on your way in. If not, maybe you can just raise your hand and we'll get some people to bring communion to you. And the elements represent the body and the blood of Jesus that was broken for you and for me for the forgiveness of our sins. And as we take these elements, may you and I get in touch with the mercy and the forgiveness, the grace of God in our lives that he loved us so much that Jesus, the King of all kings, went to a cross for you and for me that he extends mercy to us even if he receives judgment, being spat upon, being crucified in return. But as you receive that mercy in your life, God is calling you to extend that to others through compassion, through God opportunities that God's gonna place in your life where you're to do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. You're to love them like Christ has loved you and to lay your life down for another. And then he's gonna ask you also to extend the forgiveness that he's given to you because mercy is for the merciful. Jesus, we invite your spirit, God, to minister as we take communion, as we sing the song of worship and praise. God, I pray, Lord, that you would stir in our hearts, God, the remembrance, God, of your faithfulness, God, your mercy in our lives. God, that we would not be here if it were not for you. God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for forgiveness. And then God, help us to know who you want us to share the, 
compassion and the forgiveness of Jesus with around us. God, help us to not just hear these words, God, but to put it into practice. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name and all God's family said, amen.